from the Sports Zone, a catalog full of good stuff for the serious sports fan, featuring every sports video worth owning. Legends, slams, the unbelievable plays, the remarkable teams. Plus, the Sports Zone catalog is full of other great stuff for yourself or a gift. And best of all, the catalog is absolutely free. Call 1 800 488 3883 to have the Sports Zone catalog rush to your door. The Ohio State Buckeyes recaptured the throne of a champion. From their earliest flashes of brilliance in September to their Holiday Bowl victory at year's end, Ohio State earned not only a conference title, but also the respect that had sometimes proven so evasive in recent years. The spoils of their victory spoke volumes to their commitment and achievement. A Big Ten co-championship, two first-team All-Americans, seven first-team All-Big Ten, and a ranking as one of America's 10 best football teams. The 93 Buckeyes had arrived at the pinnacle that John Cooper had set out to climb when he became head coach at Ohio State. They had reignited the flames that were still burning a bright scarlet in the heart of every loyal Buckeye fan. And they had written their own memorable chapter in the legendary history of Ohio State football. In the warmth of an early September sun, Ohio Stadium was reawakening and preparing for another autumn of Buckeye football. Nowhere else in America do the roots of college football tradition run quite so deep. But the foundation of all great tradition is built of success. In the more than 100 years that the men of the Scarlet and Gray have played the game of football, they have achieved what others can only imagine. Great tradition brings great expectations. Going into this season, I thought this would be our best football team. I thought we had uh, the best athletes coming back. Uh, the fact that our football players all stayed around here during the summertime, the chemistry of this football team is the best of any place I've ever coached. And I, I realized we had good talent, the chemistry and the work habits, the leadership of those captains that, that were elected this year. I was optimistic. I thought we were going to have a good team, and we did. Ohio State opened the 1993 season with their first ever meeting against the Rice Owls. Quickly, the expectations and pulse rates of Buckeye fans were both sent racing. At the line of scrimmage, Ohio State was dominating. On the offensive line, they outmanned and overran Rice with a combination of power, quickness, and experience. Through the gaping holes that were ripped open in their path, four Ohio State backs rushed for more than 40 yards each. Raymond Harris, Butler Pinote, Eddie George, and Jeff Cothrum. The Buckeye stable of backs established a rushing command over Rice that accounted for more than 200 total yards and a touchdown. With the graduation of quarterback Kirk Herbstreet, speculation swirled around who would be the new man under center. Sophomore Bobby Hoyne or senior transfer Brett Powers? The answer was both. We knew Bobby Hoyne was going to be a good football player for us. Bobby was a second team and paid his dues. and. Uh, he, he was first team all year long. He went in the season first team quarterback, but we knew we had Brett Powers who transferred in here. We knew he was a veteran football player, a player that had started eight games for Arizona State a couple years ago. Uh, both players had a lot of similarities. Both players are very intelligent. Both had great work habits, great leadership abilities, and so I think we used them both very wisely throughout the course of the season, not only in the Rice game, but uh, in, in other games to follow. Third down and 15. The ball at the 48 of Rice. Powers is back to pass. Pressured a bit. Now throws deep over the middle to Galloway. Touchdown! Touchdown, Ohio State! A 48-yard strike over the middle. And I'll tell you what, Brett 
Powers couldn't have thrown the ball any better that time. More often than not, both Hoyne and Powers laid their passes out into the sure hands of split end Joey Galloway. Galloway came back from reconstructive knee surgery with the same uncanny speed that he had shown before his injury. Man-on-man -man coverage on number seven was like no coverage at all. Galloway was surrounded by a cadre of other great receivers, led by flanker Chris Sanders and tight end Cedric Saunders. Together, the Buckeye air attack blitzed the Owls for 246 yards and two touchdowns. The Ohio State defense was rock solid. From the strength and quickness of the front four to the speed and all-out commitment of the defensive backfield, Ohio State simply had no weak link, no chink in its armor that Rice could exploit. The Buckeye defense completely contained the Owls' attack, allowing only a single touchdown late in the game against inexperienced reserves. Sophomore middle linebacker Lorenzo Stiles led with a team-high nine tackles, followed closely with eight by defensive end Randall Brown. For the sixth straight year, John Cooper had opened the season victorious as Ohio State beat the Owls 34-7. In only the second night game ever played in Ohio State, the three-time defending Pac-10 champion Washington Huskies came to Columbus to administer the Buckeyes their first true test. Just as they had a week earlier, Ohio State took their first possession and set their sights on the enemy end zone. tailback Raymond Harris with critical strikes to Joey Galloway. Bob Hoyne advanced the offense to the Washington two. First and goal at the two. Hoyne on the give. Harris with the ball. He is into the end zone on the far side. Touchdown Ohio State. And the Buckeyes get a quick six at six nothing. Later in the first quarter, the Huskies took advantage of a muffed Ohio State punt return and moved into position to draw within four on a 29-yard field goal. Despite boasting two of the Pac-10's finest rushers, the Washington running game was ground to a halt. The Huskies could gain only 85 yards. Credit the inspired play of the Ohio State defense. Jason Simmons, Craig Powell, Dan Wilkinson, Tim Walton, and Luke Fickle combined for eight tackles for a loss. Lorenzo Stiles again led all tacklers with 14, a performance that would bring him honors as Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week. After exchanging possessions, midway through the second quarter, Ohio State was on the march again. Off the 35-yard line of Washington, fourth and two. The Buckeyes will play. Hoying is rolling out to his right, throws, has a man open, Galloway gets away at the 20, 10, 5, he is into the end zone, touchdown. 35 yards, touchdown throw, Bob Hoyne to Joey Galloway. It's 13-3 in favor of the Buckeyes. Washington scored again just before the half, but missed a two-point conversion attempt to give the Buckeyes a 14-9 advantage going into the locker room. 
Early in the fourth quarter, the Huskies drove to the Ohio State 13. In a great performance with their backs to their own goal line, Ohio State forced Washington to again settle for a field goal. But that drew them within two points. Four plays later, Ohio State had crossed into Husky territory. First and 10 for Ohio State. The football at the Washington 49-yard line. Clock on the move. A little over 11 minutes remaining. Buckeyes leading 14 to 12. Going on the give. And this is Benote. Has some daylight. 45-40. Cuts it back inside. 35-30. 25-20. 15-10-5. In goal. Touchdown. Dave, Mal Dave Mano. Jeff Cothran and Alan Klein did a great job blocking, and Butler turned on the, Bert, Butler was for real. Butler proved to the fans in that football game, the, the national tele televised audience in that football game, that, hey, we've got some speed on this team. We kept hearing about the Husky football speed, but uh, Butler, once he, got, once he got in the secondary, it was all over. He turned on the burners, and, and that is the play, in my opinion, that won the football game for us. When it was done, Number 16 Ohio State had overpowered number 12 Washington, 21 to 12 on national television. The tone for Ohio State's first road game of the 93 season against the Pitt Panthers was set from the moment of the opening kickoff. All right, we're set for football, a beautiful Saturday, and the opening kickoff is coming to the near side of the field. It bounces at the 15, picked up by Benote at the 11. He's across the 15, near side 20, 25, 30, still on his feet, tripped up. He could go all the way. He's at the 40, he's at the 30, he's at the 20, he's at the 10. He goes all the way, touchdown. The Buckeyes ran rock shot through the badly outmanned Panthers of first-year coach Johnny Majors, scoring the next four times they touched the ball and holding a commanding 35 to nothing lead less than a minute into the second quarter. Ohio State piled up over 500 yards of total offense with 307 coming on the ground. Nine different backs carried the ball for the Buckeyes. Joey Galloway pulled in two scoring passes and added six points on this reverse to give him his first three touchdown afternoon. The Buckeye defense was equally awesome. In the first half, they held the Panthers to only 71 yards in total offense. They forced three pit turnovers, including pass interceptions by Buckeye DBs Tito Paul and Chico Nelson that set up two of Ohio State's nine touchdowns. Ohio State left Pittsburgh that afternoon with a 63 to 28 win that would lift them to number six in the polls as they readied themselves to enter the race for the Big Ten Championship. On a gray and chilly day in early October, Ohio State opened their quest for a conference crown, a gauntlet through arguably America's most difficult conference. In the next eight weeks, the Buckeyes would line up against five ranked teams. Step number one was Northwestern. Well, Northwestern was a good football team. Northwestern was two and one. Northwestern had just beaten Boston College a week before. They had beaten, uh, they had beaten Wake Forest, so they're two and one and had played Notre Dame a tough ball game. So uh, no, that was not uh, that was not a game where we felt like we're going to go out there and they're going to lay down and, and you know play dead for us. We felt like we had to be ready to play, and we were. Uh, that's a team that can slip up on you, so we we can't let that happen to us. From the opening drive, it was clear Ohio State was serious about Northwestern. For the fourth straight week, the Buckeyes scored on their opening possession, this time on a Tim Williams kick that also made him the leading Ohio State field goal kicker with 42, a record he would expand to 43 in just the second quarter. Defensively, the Wildcat attack that had served them so well in the preseason had lost its claws. A mere 162 yards in total offense. Five pass interceptions by Walter Taylor, Chico Nelson, Tim Patello, and Lorenzo Styles. 146 yards in interception returns. Five other passes broken up. And 29 separate Buckeyes with tackles on Northwestern ball carriers. Ohio State dissected the Wildcat defense at will with a game plan that featured 284 yards in passing. Nine Buckeyes pulled in strikes from Hoyne and Powers, led by Joey Galloway with six. The OSU rushing attack contributed five touchdowns and was led by Raymond Harris with 74 yards. 
In just two games, Ohio State had scored 114 points, the most prolific back-to-back -back total since 1950. The road to the Big Ten Championship passed directly through Memorial Stadium on the campus of the University of Illinois. This was a challenge not to be taken lightly. In five previous tries, John Cooper had been unable to beat the Illini. Today, that spell was about to be broken, but not without a battle. On Illinois' first play from scrimmage, Jason Simmons recovers an Illini fumble to give the Buckeyes the ball and great field position. Three plays later, Bobby Hoyne uncoils to split end Joey Galloway to put Ohio State on the board in their first possession for the fifth straight week. After three and out on Illinois' next possession, Hoyne again has the Buckeye offense pointed downfield in high gear. Tim Williams kicks his longest field goal of the year, a 52-yarder to give Ohio State a 10 to nothing lead. 1993 was a special year for special teams, and this day was no exception. Late in the second quarter, the Buckeye defense paced by big plays from Dan Wilkinson, Lorenzo Stiles, and Tim Walton have the Illini pinned against their own end zone. Larson in there to punt again. He's pressured, and the ball's knocked away from him, recovered in the end zone for a touchdown by Ohio State. The Buckeyes came swarming in on Brett Larson. He had trouble handling the snap. And Ohio State recovers that loose football in the end zone for a touchdown. For Ohio State, it was a fitting finale to a first half that gave them a 17-3 halftime lead as they held Illinois to only 53 yards in total offense. In the second half, with a 14-point margin and a strong north win, Ohio State hunkered down for the final 30 minutes. The worst conditions, I think that's the worst conditions we've ever played a football game in. I remember we're leading 17 to three at halftime. They had their choice to, the second half where they're gonna take the ball or defend a certain end of the field. Uh, they gave us the ball. That's how bad the conditions were to start the second half. 20 mile an hour wind blowing right in your face coming out of the north. Uh, but we did what we had to do to win the football game. It wasn't a very exciting game in the second half. We kept the ball on the ground. Uh, we kept it away from their offense during the third quarter and were able to come out with a great, uh, with, a, uh, with a solid victory. With its Air Force grounded, Raymond Harris and Jeff Cothran became the workhorses of the Buckeye offensive attack. This was classic, grinded out, hard nosed football. In the third quarter, although Ohio State kept the door to the end zone solidly shut, Illinois did move deep enough to allow three field goals that brought them within five points. Late in the final period, Tim Williams kicked a 39 yard field goal for Ohio State to give the Buckeyes a 20 to 12 lead. But it was not until Tim Walton picked off an Illinois pass in the end zone with just 47 seconds left on the clock that the Ohio State win was secure, breaking a five-year drought against the Illini and moving the Buckeyes to a number five national ranking. The weekend of October 16th was a special time in Columbus. It was homecoming and the 25th anniversary reunion of the 1968 Ohio State Buckeyes the last team in the Big Ten to capture the national championship. In their time, the names from that squad dominated not only college football, but also the rosters of the NFL for years to come. Nearly 70 men returned. John Brockington, the son of Rufus Mays, Jim Stillwagon, Jack Tatum, Rex Kern, and Ann Hayes, wife of their legendary coach, Woody. It made this homecoming a special moment in time. But the sharpest focus fell on the game between the Buckeyes and 25th ranked Michigan State. The Spartans just a week earlier had upset Michigan to immediately rivet the attention of every other team in the Big Ten. After being held only two catches for 22 yards in the windstorm at Illinois, Joey Galloway came back with a vengeance. Don't be surprised to see a play action pass here. Sure enough, fake give. Hoying looks to throw, fires near the goal line, and touchdown Joey Galloway. A 22-yard 
touchdown reception. Galloway with his eighth touchdown of the year. The Buckeyes keep a couple streaks going right there. They've scored on their first possession now in all six games. And Joey Galloway has had at least one touchdown in every game this season. Galloway's aerial circus act didn't close until he had pulled down nine catches for a gaudy 186 yards. The Buckeye defense held the Spartans in check for most of the first half, yielding only a field goal and a touchdown, the first rushing score that D had surrendered all season. The 21-10 Ohio State lead held firm throughout the third period. But then, Michigan State hit on a 21-yard field goal four seconds into the final period of play. After a near flawless first half, the Buckeye offense broke stride in the third and early fourth quarters, turning the ball over on two interceptions and a fumble. With just under six minutes to play, Michigan State took over on the Ohio State 38-yard line and like lightning drew to within two. The Spartans tied the game when they connected on a pass into the corner of the end zone. It was Ohio State first and 80 to go on the Michigan 20. Well, that offensive team came off the field. And there was no question they were going to move the ball down the field. Absolutely. You could feel the confidence. Uh, senior, that's what happens when you've got a senior dominated offensive football team. The offensive line did a great job. Uh, Brett Powers did a great job. The running backs, uh, Jeff Cosman blocked and Raymont ran as well as he ran all season long. And of course, as we mentioned, Galloway made some great plays. So, no, the confidence level was such in that ball game that we knew that we had a job to do, and hey, let's go get it done. Quarterback Brett Powers, who seemed to thrive on life in a pressure cooker, set the offense in motion, using every weapon at his command, including three separate running backs and three receivers. He masterfully captained a 14-play drive to the Spartan Seven. Ball near the six-yard line. The give goes to Raymond Harris. He's on his way, and he gets to the end zone. Touchdown, Ohio State. He just ran over three more players. He would not be denied right there. A seven-yard touchdown run, and Ohio State is on top, 27-21. to Raymond Harris's touchdown assured the Buckeyes their sixth straight victory of the 93 season and propelled upward by losses by Florida and a tie by Alabama. Ohio State was about to be voted the third best team in America. It had been three years since the Purdue Boilermakers were on the Ohio State schedule. For the first time, John Cooper's Buckeyes would line up against his former assistant, Jim Coletto. That's a game of going against Jim Coletto that I personally wanted to win. I mean, you can't let a guy that worked for you for six years come back and win, you know, beat you. And we beat him. We, we completely dominated. I, I had a good feeling going into the ball game because I knew we had the best football team. If we don't foul it up, we don't go over there and get a bunch of stupid penalties and, and uh, you know, just, just lay down. We're going to win that football game. Our team came out and was really ready to play. And, you know, from the get-go, it was very obvious that we were the best football team. Ohio State's offensive juggernaut ran wild against Purdue. Raymond Harris led the way with 118 yards his second straight 100-yard-plus performance. Seven ball carriers posted double-figure rushing stats. 364 of Ohio State's 486 total yards came by way of the run. The Buckeye defense not only held the Boilermakers to a scant seven points through three quarters, but they created some scoring excitement of their own. And on first down, they fake the give, they throw it to the end zone, it's picked off by Ohio State! And this might be a 100-yard return for Marlon Turner. He'll go down the near side of the field. He's at the 30, 20, 10. He's going all the way. Ohio State left West Lafayette with a 45-24 win and came yet a step closer to their goal of a Big Ten crown. Penn State Nittany Lions arrived at a Big Ten with a championship heritage and a legendary coach. They intended to make their presence immediately known. Penn State was number 12 in the nation, Ohio State number three. The meeting of two great football superpowers was the premier ticket on the 1993 Ohio State home schedule. Playing in a freak autumn snowstorm, the Buckeyes decisively silenced the Nittany Lions roar. The two offenses became a study of contrast. Penn State, after finding only marginal success in their running game, went to the air. The results were dismal. 
The Lions completed only 13 of their 39 attempts and surrendered the ball four times on interceptions and once again on a fumble. But credit the Ohio State defense, led by Craig Powell with 11 tackles and Walter Taylor with 10. The Buckeyes, on the other hand, found success on the ground. Raymond Harris carried 32 times for 159 yards and averaged nearly five yards every time he tucked the ball away. Leading the quiet storm downfield was the finest offensive line in the Big Ten. Seniors Alan Klein, Jason Winrow, Jack Thrush, Dave Mono, and sophomore Corey Stringer. They advanced the Buckeye ground attack through gaping holes that they pried open in the Penn State defense almost at will. Yeah, in a big ball game like that, if you can dominate the line of scrimmage, that's, that's, that's how you win. And our offensive line just came off the ball and completely dominated Penn State's defense. And Raymond had a great ball game for us. And, you know, the best defense you can have is when, they're say, when, when your offensive team has the ball. And that's exactly what happened. We dominated on, on the offensive side of the ball, kept the ball away from their high-powered high, high offensive football team. And... Uh, came out with a solid victory. Ohio State's command of the trenches was showcased in the opening drive of the second half. In just nine plays, all by the run, the Buckeyes move 64 yards to the Penn State Ford. Bonote back in there at tailback. He gets the give, goes to the far side of the field. If he turns the corner, he's in. Touchdown, Ohio State. Butler Bonote goes into the northeast corner of the end zone, untouched. You're not going to catch him. There's no way. And from four yards out, Ohio State puts six more on the board. It's now 23 to six. Penn State which had come to Columbus averaging 34 points a game, was held to just a pair of field goals as Ohio State initiated the conference newcomer with a 24-6 spanking before a crowd of 95,000 and a national television audience. No other team in the Big Ten had derailed Ohio State's title hopes more consistently or surprisingly than Wisconsin. Just a year earlier, the Badgers came from nowhere to upset Ohio State on this same Camp Randall field. This year, however, Wisconsin was for real. Number 12 in the nation with a powerful and talent-laden offense. But the course of this critical Big Ten matchup was to be decided by great defensive play. For the first time this season, Ohio State was unable to score on their opening possession. But the Ohio State defense, paced by a five-yard tackle for a loss delivered by Big Daddy Dan Wilkinson, forced Wisconsin into three and out. Starting on their own 30 and propelled totally through the running of Raymond Harris and Butler Benote, Ohio State moved to the Badger three in only six plays. Second and goal from the three, backs in the eye. Give goes to Raymond Harris, right up the middle. Did he get into the end zone? Touchdown, Ohio State! Raymond Harris with the touchdown, and Ohio State has a 6 nothing lead. Ohio State carried the seven-point lead till late in the second quarter when Wisconsin scored on an eight-yard pass to tie the game at the half. The Batchers opened the second half of play with a convincing drive to the door of the Ohio State red zone. But a great defensive play by Jason Simmons, followed by a Walter Taylor pass interception, stopped the threat. However, Ohio State was unable to move the ball and punted to the Badgers from deep in their own territory. This time, Wisconsin would not be denied and took the lead on a three-yard run. Despite a seven-point deficit and a growingly hostile clock, Ohio State floundered badly on its next four possessions, including throwing two interceptions. But each time the Buckeye defense answered the call, bending ever so slightly, but never allowing Wisconsin to expand their lead. Finally, with less than five minutes remaining, Brett Powers huddled the offense in their own end zone, 99 yards away from the Badger goal line. First, a strike to Joey Galloway to the 16. 
Then, in a split second, the Buckeyes are in Wisconsin territory on another Powers to Galloway connection. Tight end Cedric Saunders adds 11 yards on this catch to the Badger 26. Powers barking out the signals. They give play action again. He throws and touchdown Joey Galloway. 27 yards. He was open. Galloway scores. And Ohio State to within a point of Wisconsin. It's now 14 to 13. Four plays, 99 yards, seven points. And now a 14 to 14 tie. In the next 10 plays, Wisconsin staged a comeback of their own, driving 65 yards in 10 plays to the Ohio State 15. Little more than an extra point away from victory. It comes down to this. Wisconsin back on the field. Schnitzky, a left footer. The kick is up and the kick is blocked. It's blocked by Ohio State. It looked like Marlon Kerner blocked it for the Buckeyes. And this game with one second remaining will end up in a tie. Schnitzky's kick is blocked by Marlon Kerner. One second remaining in the ball game. The Buckeyes are going to get a chance. They're lined up to kick a, a chip shot. It's going to chip shot field goal. It's going to win the game. And uh, Marlon Kerner came off the corner. Great effort and laid out. And again, that's something that we work on every day in practice. And it wasn't luck, but the, 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 it was a great effort on Marlon Kerner's uh, part. And Marlon allowed us to come out of there with a tie. Uh, obviously, we'd rather win the football game, but a tie is a heck of a lot better than going up there and getting beat. The tie tarnished Ohio State's dreams of a national championship, but still left them in control of their own destiny for a Big Ten crown. The final home game of 1993 against the Indiana Hoosiers was moved to late Saturday afternoon for broadcast on ABC television. Earlier in the day, Illinois had lost to Penn State. Because of that, the Buckeyes knew when they took the field that a win over Indiana would assure them at least a share of the Big Ten title. I think that gave us some incentive to really play well against Indiana. Some people think, well, you didn't play as well against Indiana as you did some other teams. I, I don't buy that. Indiana was a good, solid football team. And for us to go out there and win that game and give us at least a share of the Big Ten Conference Championship, uh, you know, meant an awful, awful lot to me and our, and our assistant football coaches and this football team. Midway through the first period, after exchanging pairs of three and out possessions, Ohio State mounted the first sustained attack of the game. Beginning on their own 14, the Buckeyes, led by Bobby Hoyne, unharnessed their offensive might in a 16-play ball control drive, reaching the Indiana four in the early seconds of the second quarter. Rose into the end zone for Galloway. Touchdown, Ohio State. Joey Galloway with the reception. That's his 13th touchdown of the year. He beat Moss Richardson in the northwest corner of the end zone. 6-0 Ohio State. After the defense stopped the Hoosiers on their next possession, Tim Williams increased the Buckeyes' lead to 10 on a 36-yard field goal. After a 53-yard return of the Ohio State kickoff, Indiana posted their first three points and then added another seven after a Buckeye fumble near midfield. A 10-10 tie late in the first half. Raymond Harris generated some kick return electricity of his own when he slipped tackles and powered his way for 47 yards. This time, with senior Brett Powers calling the signals, the offense struck back with a seven-play drive that found Buster Tillman open in the right end zone for six. Tim Williams added his 82nd consecutive point after touchdown to give the Buckeyes a 17-10 lead at the break. The final 30 minutes of this game will always be remembered most for great defense and for great defensive players. Ohio State, a single victory away from their dream of a conference championship, turned off the switch to the Hoosier offense. They held Indiana to only 238 yards, only 31 by rushing, nine tackles for a loss, and four quarterback sacks. Mark Williams, Dan Wilkinson, Lorenzo Styles, familiar names with reputations for big plays. But on this day, a new name would emerge to lead all other Ohio State tacklers, reserve defensive end Jason Gwynn. Replacing injured starter Randall Brown, 
Gwen went wild in the Hoosier offense. Nine total tackles, an amazing five stops for a loss, and two quarterback sacks. Jason Gwen had seized the moment as his own. In the third quarter, Tim Williams made good on field goals of 23 and 22 yards to give the Buckeyes a 23 to 10 advantage. But Indiana answered with a fourth quarter rushing touchdown to cut the lead to a fragile six points. With only 2.38 left in the game, both victory and a Big Ten title on the line, Indiana set out for Ohio State territory. Wide open, but a fine defensive play by Walter Taylor to strip the ball away. Back to back to his ditto. Has some time. Pressure six. It looked like Jason Gwynn got him on the quarterback sack, a loss of seven yards, and what a game Jason Gwynn has had today. You know, marks out the signals, back to pass, pressured again, throws it, and it's incomplete. It's nearly picked up. Jason Gwynn again broke in and leveled the quarterback, Chris Ditto. In that moment, a share of the conference crown was assured. Despite a disappointing loss just a week later in Ann Arbor, the Buckeyes had returned to replant the Ohio State flag at the top of the Big Ten. There was yet a final chapter to write, a Holiday Bowl matchup with BYU. But for the moment, it was a time of remembrance and rewards, of a season played out by the men of the Scarlet and Gray from the pages of a championship script. Early on the morning of December 12th, tragedy struck the Ohio State football family. Sophomore defensive end Jason Gwynn, who had distinguished himself so dramatically in the Indiana game, was killed in a two-car crash near campus. In memory of their teammate, the Buckeyes dedicated their Holiday Bowl game to Jason and his family. San Diego, California, site of the Holiday Bowl, matching Ohio State with the Cougars of BYU. As Ohio State players know so well, a bowl invitation is really much more than just the game itself. It's a reward for a great season. At the Holiday Bowl, that means a time to relax in the warm California sun. This was Ohio State's second appearance in the Holiday Bowl at Jack Murphy Stadium each against the Cougars of Brigham Young University. BYU's six and five record may have caused some to believe that this game was a mismatch, but the Buckeyes always took the Cougars' big play capability very seriously. I think our team was so disappointed the way they played against Michigan. Uh, to see a, a fantastic season, uh, you know, sort of disappearing from you. Uh, it wasn't hard at all to get our team motivated. The team, the team knew that, hey, we're going to the bowl game, and this year we're going to win the bowl game. From the beginning, it was clear that each team would take a separate path on their quest for victory. BYU's passing game is legendary and supported only by the facade of a real rushing attack. On the other hand, Ohio State had proven so many Saturdays throughout the season that they could work from a position of strength from both their passing and running attacks. They were equipped to take what their opponent's defense could not deny. After winning the toss and electing to receive, Ohio State moved the opening kickoff to just inside BYU territory. Then the drive slowed, forcing a Tim Williams punt. In three tries, BYU futilely struggled to move beyond their own 20. The stage was set for the first points of the game. He's waiting at the Ohio State 40-yard line. Boardman, the punter, awaits the snap at the five. It was a low snap, and the Buckeyes break in and block it, and the ball's recovered and taking it into the end zone for a touchdown. It was Tim Fatillo who came away with that loose ball. Ohio State blocks the punt. Only the second time this season Boardman has had a punt block. It was a low snap, and Ohio State on the scoreboard at 6 nothing. BYU answered that score on their next possession with a five-play, 65-yard touchdown drive to tie the game at seven. But the offensive fireworks had only begun. Ohio State was ready to run and roll. Raymond Harris, Jeff Cothran, and Butler Bonote hand-carried the ball 80 yards downfield 
paced by Benote's 44-yard sprint to the BYU 26. When Raymond Harris plunged over from the two, it looked as if this game was on the verge of becoming an old-fashioned shootout. Again, late in the first quarter, Bobby Hoyne set out from the Buckeyes' own eight. Just over three minutes later, the ball was resting at the door of the Cougar end zone. Buckeyes at the line of scrimmage. First and goal at the BYU two-yard line. Backs are in the eye. William Houston in at the fullback position. Give goes to Raymond Harris. He goes right up the middle, gets near the goal line. Touchdown, Ohio State. Yeah, a late call. signal by the official. Raymond with a second score already in this game. And he got a nice block from Jason Winrow. Fouled the senior left guard. And Ohio State on top right now at BYU. The Buckeyes lead it 20 to 7. Ohio State had opened a 14 point lead at 21 to 7 but never, never count BYU out. Before halftime, the Cougars had connected on touchdown passes of eight and 27 yards to bring the game into a 21 to 21 tie at the break. In the third period, after a missed field goal attempt by BYU in a three and out series for the Buckeyes, the Ohio State defense stepped up to get the game off center. On a second down play, Tito Paul intercepted a BYU pass. With a nine-play drive, seven of them rushes from Raymond Harris, Ohio State scored again to take a 28-21 lead. In the next possession for each team, solid clock-eating drives were wasted. First, BYU bogged down inside the Buckeye red zone, and Ohio State set up a field goal that sailed wide right. The Ohio State point of attack was Raymond Harris. 39 times, number 34 answered the call, devouring Cougar real estate in more than six yard chunks. Before this night was done, Harris set a new Holiday Bowl rushing record of 235 yards and two touchdowns. Time is draining from the game for BYU. But with only 43 seconds left, they connect on a 52-yard strike that brings them to the Buckeye Six. But this was to be their final glory. After completing 25 of 40 attempts, the Cougars' passing attack turns to stone. Four throws to the end zone, each tumbling futilely to the ground. Ohio State had made good on John Cooper's guarantee of a bowl victory. They had also drawn down the curtain on a 10-win season, only the eighth Ohio State team ever to reach that mark. For decades to come, when Ohio State fans look back over the years of football glory, the 93 Buckeyes will be remembered as a team who wrote a championship script.